Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Aseptic Manufacturing Planning for Multiple Product Indications and Presentations, presented by Grand River Aseptic Manufacturing. I'm Julia Douthart, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speakers today are Rebecca Hones, Business Development Executive, Grand River Aseptic Manufacturing, Michael Denzer, Vice President, Technical Solutions, Kymanox, Jennifer Ryder, Senior Director, Business and Technical Operations, Services and Solutions at West Pharmaceutical. You can read their full bios on the left side of your window by selecting the Speakers tab. So just a few quick technical notes before we begin. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there's no dial-in number. So for the best audio quality, make sure the volume on your computer is up. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand within 24 hours after the event. And we'll start today with some introductions and a panel discussion, and then there will be time for Q&A. So please submit your questions using the questions and answers tab on the left side of your screen. Okay, so now let's begin. Panelists, welcome. So I'd like to start off today by having each of you tell us just a little about yourself so we um, could get to know you better. And then we'll go ahead and launch into uh, some questions that we've prepared for you. We can start with Michael. Hi, um, this is Michael Denzer with Kymanox. Um, I've been in combination product, pharma and bio, um, biotech product development as well as process development for about 28 years. And um, my passion and personal mission is to bring valuable new products to the market to people in need. Rebecca? Hi, I'm Rebecca Hones. I am a business development executive with Graham, which is Grand River Aseptic Manufacturing. I joined Graham earlier this year. And prior to that, I was spent, or I was working at SHOT, um, I worked closely with uh, West Technical Services Group. And then prior to that, I worked at Amgen, where I also worked with Michael um, in their primary container engineering group. So I'm happy to be here today. Hi, my name is Jennifer Ryder, and I have been with West Pharmaceutical Services for 26 years in a variety of roles, starting out in the laboratory into technical services. Uh, into sales and marketing, then into running our quality uh, and global laboratory organization, our global laboratory organization under quality. And I am currently uh, responsible for the business and technical operations for services and solutions. Uh, we work with customers, especially around combination products uh, to successfully bring their products to market, utilizing the different delivery systems and con containment systems that West has to, to offer. Welcome. So we're looking at um, kind of what's driving things. So we're going to look at um, the delivery uh, of different components and where, where we start this progression. So here's the first question. What is driving the push to develop new drugs in multiple drug delivery components while still progressing through clinical development. So that's very, very early on, it seems. Michael, would you like to start? Yeah, certainly. I'd like to take a, a shot at this. So, um, you know, certainly the, the business environment today is, is quite challenging. Um, and I, I think that as a risk mitigation, businesses are looking to come to the market or at least begin to develop um, different formats of the same product and possibly for different indications. Um, there's quite a lot of challenge in the competitive landscape, as well as something that <clears throat> engineering types like myself don't consider often, but the reimbursement landscape, um, it, it's quite challenging. So what we may think is a good idea, uh, maybe sending a treatment home to a patient, um, we may be surprised at the end of our long development that um, it's not going to be reimbursed as expected. So as a, a business 
mitigation some companies are trying to develop um, several different formats. So I'll jump into that and then I'll let Rebecca uh, speak to that from, from that perspective. So uh, yeah, exactly what Mike uh, indicated in terms of looking at the, del the different delivery system formats that are out there, especially with biologics, um, they're looking for the best way to deliver that uh, unique biologic um, and more complicated biologic to the patient, uh, which would be uh, more, pati more patient and user friendly. So things that you may have seen in the past with having to deliver, to go to the clinic, to deliver in IVs, um, today they're looking at how can the patient um, self-administer this, um, for mm -hmm. example, um, or go to an on-body system, which is put on the patient by a clinician, but then that drug is delivered over time. So to be competitive as well as to make it a, a better patient experience, they're looking at different platforms to deliver that biologic to the, to the patient. And I'll let Rebecca pick it up from there. <laughs> No, that was very good because just to follow on what both of you said is we see clients come to us and they have it in two different formats. I mean, they want to have them go parallel. They have a vial and they have a syringe and they want to just get it out there. And um, definitely self-administration is a new trend. I mean, they want to do it themselves and not have to go into a clinic because that takes time. So we're definitely seeing that. So how do you prepare for multiple scenarios of products being studied for multiple indications and delivery options? So how do you how do you prepare for this? How do you get started? You know, I know uh, Mike and Rebecca <laughs> have, have a lot to to say on this, too, from different perspectives, which is great coming from the different parts of the industry. You know, one one thing is uh, thinking about life cycle management of where that drug product you're going to start and launch to market with to where really you want it to to get to in the end of that life cycle management. So, for example, you might start within a vial stopper and seal platform containment system and eventually move into a pre-filled syringe and in the end maybe put that into an auto injector so what you want to make sure is you're thinking about that during development is you know where is this product going to go where do we need it to go based on the patient needs um, and also what that experience is for the patient um, so you want to think about that ahead of time and different ways to do that may, might be to look at containment systems, that primary containment that's holding the drug, right? You have to look at that from a physical, functional, as well as chemical compatibility perspective. So you want to make sure in the beginning you're picking the right types of materials that are going and going to contain that drug. And you want to think about, okay, when I move into a pre-filled syringe, are those same materials available in a pre-filled syringe format to contain that drug? And then again, you know, putting that pre-filled syringe into a auto injector. So you wanna make sure across that life cycle that you're thinking about it from, from beginning to end and making sure that you're starting out the right way and thinking about the, with having the future in, in mind. And I'll have, hand it over to my industry colleagues yeah. here. Yeah, if I can pick it up. So as uh, as Jen mentioned, so multiple formats, not only do you have to plan for the uh, primary container aspects and of course, you know, who's going to do the fill finish, but your your total project plan, your whole CMC strategy can be vastly different depending on what kind of format you pick. Um, your project plan can be impacted um, if you say going from a vial to a pre-filled syringe or multiple at the same time, your plans will be very different. If you're developing just about anything other than a, just a vial in a carton, you're now going into the combination product realm. And there's quite a bit of uh, regulatory requirements as well as a uh, real tactical um, project plan impacts such as increased cost and perhaps a much longer timeline. Um, and we can talk about that more later. Becca? Yeah, I think having the conversations 
as soon as you have the product discussion is really important so you can get into the right container or get into the right um, product. So Jen, to follow up on what you said, um, you need to have those conversations and work with someone that has the experience, which I'm seeing a trend as the suppliers now are trying to get into the drug manufacturers early on and be, you know, those conversations, whether than having it already filled in a container that's going to have issues down the way. So you have the risk, and you spend a lot of money and you have to have those on like discussions very early on. To add on to that, uh, Rebecca, you're you're exactly right. And you know, um, working in with pharmaceutical manufacturers as well as the biologics, um, we want to make sure that when we get in there, the materials that are used to contain that product, whether it's a pre-filled syringe, whether it's a vial stopper and seal, is actually appropriate for that drug product and making sure you minimize and mitigate any risks with interactions between the material and the drug product. So utilization of your suppliers in the industry is is critical because there there's an awareness there of what may have been issues in the past of uh, incompatibility between a certain material and a certain, let's say, drug solvent system or preservative that might be used in in the drug from from that perspective so it's very critical early on to work with your suppliers of your containment systems like i said or uh, combination product systems uh, d depending on where you're going so i just wanted to to reinforce what rebecca indicated there thank you in, in addition to that if i can add so recent supply chain issues are causing a lot of headache for the industry. So what you maybe initially select as your primary components may not be readily available according to your project plan when you need them. So it's even more critical to, to work with your suppliers and your CDMO. So how do you build your supply chain and internal suppliers? So how, how do you plan for multiple CDMOs? I think, you know, coming from the drug industry, I think it's important to uh, really do a very thorough investigation of your CDMO's capabilities and to ensure that they have, uh, I mean, ideally you want to use a single CDMO to do as much as you can. Uh, but mm -hmm. you, So you need to understand not just their technical capabilities from a, say, scientific perspective but also you need to maybe understand the nitty-gritty of their equipment and their equipment capability um, and their equipment capability will also drive your primary packaging component uh, selection yes to further add to that having partnerships so at graham we have partnerships with bausch and strobel and then we also have partnerships with the component suppliers as well, which helps us. So during the pandemic, when there was issues, those partnerships really helped us maintain our supply chain. I mean, they, we didn't get the materials like right away, but we were able to work with them and have, you know, the equipment be ready if it, we had to switch suppliers or, you know, keep the business going. So. Mm. Yeah. So when, you know, of course, working with both in tandem, both the CDMO as well as the suppliers of the materials that you're using uh, for for containment of your product is is important because you have to work with them in parallel, as Mike indicated you may get a recommendation from a supplier, but then when you take that containment system to your CDMO, they may have no experience running that particular system or that particular material. Um, so it's very important that you understand up front as you start your, you know, your early screening studies of the component system with the drug product, and looking at that compatibility early on, you want to make sure that you're working with the, the CDMO also has experience in running that type of containment system, whether it's a, a vial, a stopper, a seal, or it's plunger, you know, going into a pre-filled syringe glass mm -hmm. or plastic barrel whether it's a steak needle, lore lock, et cetera. So you want to make sure that there is um, sharing on both ends. Uh, we work with a lot of 
uh, different type of CDMOs, including, you know, Grand, Grand River, uh, mm -hmm. where we want to make sure that they have the appropriate experience and appropriate things in place to be able to run the components and the systems as they move forward. So you've got to take that into consideration as part of your life cycle management, right? So you're looking not only at the, the components and the containment system, but then you're looking, okay, well, how am I going to get these into a manufacturing environment and making sure that that CDMO um, has experience of running that and being able to scale that up for you to your commercial quantities to get you to that that successful um, marketing of that product. So once you've selected your your uh, suppliers and your CDMO, there may be an additional step. I mean, obviously, there's the quality aspects, quality audits, quality agreements. But once you enter combination product requirements, there's an additional step of purchasing controls, and you may need to do additional levels of risk assessment along with your suppliers and your CDMO partners. So that's above and beyond what you would traditionally do for just a vial and needs to be into in your uh, project plan. Is there typically one driver that trends you towards a particular CDMO? Is it a cost? Is it quality parameter? Is it um, the supplier, you know, the supply chain issues? Is there anything in particular that usually drives that decision making? From yeah. a client <laughs> perspective, traditionally, I mean, there's, there's not been a tremendous amount of choices. <laughs> but uh -huh. now that that seems to be <clears throat> That seems to be resolving itself, uh, thankfully. But then you look at the technical and capability um, uh, of each company and really w where are you going with your products? In the case of a company that's trying to develop multiple formats, it becomes critical that, again, the, the CDMO has the equipment, has the technical know-how, maybe has the supply chain uh, savvy to get you your components when you need them. Um, and then, of course, as we mentioned, like the quality aspects, uh, is the CDMO compliant? And, um, you know, are they keeping up on their, their quality uh, duties? So it can be a quite a complex uh, selection matrix. Um, uh, um, and it's good to see that the CDMOs are really uh, stepping up to the industry to meet industry needs and being able to to meet all those requirements. They definitely like the one stop shop. So if you are coming in with a phase two or phase three, the ability to scale up, uh, go commercial. So that's a very attractive feature to have for a CDMO. And then also to be able to go through the whole packaging and distribution. So you don't have to deal with multiple CDMOs for each unit operation. Um, geographically, the location sometimes is important. So if your markets are U.S. and, for example, Canada, you may want to choose one that's located in either of those regions. But um, there are not that many choices out there. So Michael is correct in saying that. Um, and it just depends on the definitely the quality record, you know, if they're staying out of the news. <laughs> and then um, also um, just the capabilities as well. So FDA, <laughs> so a question that's going to go towards regulatory coming, coming your way. What are the FDA and regulatory requirements that you're seeing impact approvals for multiple indications and drug delivery platforms? So what's trending here? Yeah. I think as uh, Mike mentioned earlier, combination products is is a big uh, trending area that we see due, just due to uh, what happened with COVID and people, you know, wanting to be able to administer their therapies at home due to the fact they may not have been able to get them during, you know, during COVID uh, from, from that perspective and during the pandemic. So you see a lot of, um, 
change in industry even before COVID going to combination products to have that better experience for the patient. But I think uh, it's been um, quickly increased uh, during COVID due to the fact that many patients could could not get out or couldn't administer their own their own um, therapies at home. So certainly an increased um, awareness and development in the areas of, of combination products. And when you think of combination products, Mike mentioned the regulatory aspects, and you have to think about the U.S. aspects um, on, under combination products, as we put it, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you think about Europe, you think about the European Union uh, MDRs or medical device regulations from, from that end combined with a medicinal product, right? So different terminology. Um, also, some changes that we we saw with within the MDRs to uh, look at uh, medicinal products combined with medical devices from from that perspective. So you want to make sure that you really understand that regulatory pathway, depending on where you're going to commercialize your product and get it approved. Um, different, not only from the U.S. and and the European Union. But you also have to think of the changes that we saw within the European Union with Brexit um, and, you know, making sure that if you're moving forward with some something in those countries, it may or may not fall fall under the EU MDRs. Um, also with the notified bodies and understanding how that pathway needs to move forward, working with notified bodies is also important. So it has gotten, it has gotten um, increase, increase, increasingly, um, I would say complicated, if I could get those words out, um, increasingly complicated to really understand what do I need to do to bring this combination product to market. Um, and depending on where you are going to market and um, get that product approved will depend on what that pathway and what that development and the type of expectations for that area need to do. So it's, it's very important that you work with your suppliers, your CDMOs, your regulatory and quality consultants to really put your pathway together of how you're going to work in each phase of development, combining that drug development with the device in parallel to move that combination product to commercialization. So that's really a, a lot of the challenges that we have worked with and seen with our with our customers um, that are manufacturing biologics and small molecules going into combination products. Yeah, it's it's increasingly important to find uh, partners with current FDA experience. Of course, you can go out and read the regulations. You can try to follow the news and see what's happening with approvals and and other uh, regulatory actions, but there's no substitute for having a partner that has very active, recent, ongoing FDA experiences. Um, we see that the agency is uh, very uh, active at applying regulations across the board, uh, taking some expectations from emergency use injection devices and applying them to non-emergency injection devices, say. Um, there's increased scrutiny on your uh, essential performance requirements, which are functional tests for these systems. Um, and there's not a lot of capability in the United States to actually do this testing, um, let's say in an experienced way. So, uh, you may ha you may have additional risk uh, when you're trying to set up these tests that your your uh, your partner may not have the proper experience to do it, and with the agency uh, focus on these areas, uh, it becomes more and more critical to make sure that you have experienced partners. Yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting you brought up EPRs, um, Mike, from, from that perspective, because um, interpreting EPRs and what they are is your first um, challenge, right? And uh, understanding what they are, and then also determining, well, how do I term determine my essential performance requirements of my combination product? 
Um, and once I determine what those are through my risk assessment, okay, now how do I justify them, risk mitigate them, and develop analytical methodology to be able to test uh, these different types of essential performance requirements. And with the different platforms that are out there, such as on body systems or auto injectors, right? Every, every different device has its unique approach in terms of how to, how it performs and maybe how you need to set up the analytical approach to it. So you want to make sure that you are working with with the partners, uh, whether it's your device supplier or a contract laboratory organization or component supplier or delivery system supplier, that they really understand uh, the CQAs of that combination product that the manufacturer has determined to be. And then from that, the CQAs and the uh, the subset EPRs, which actually they're going to have to move forward to test. Now, what we're hoping to see come out in the next few months is actually a guidance around essential performance requirements. Uh, originally, this was supposed to come out in June, um, but there has been some delays in actually putting this out. But from what I understand, it's actually now in final uh, final review to to come out. So we're hoping to see that uh, to clarify some of the expectations here in 2022 by the end of the year around essential performance requirements and the expectations around those. So uh, glad you you actually brought that up. <laughs> so are there any other requirements or regulations that we should be looking at on the horizon? <laughs> Yes. Compendia requirements around CCS, perhaps, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, yeah, I'll take that one. My, Mike's looking at me and handed it over to me. So when you look at compendi you know, compendia requirements, so there's several things going on here. You have guidances coming out from the regulatory agencies and the expectations. You have the ISO, right, and the changes within the ISO, for example, with the 11608 that just came out that was updated and having to make sure that your your product meets those requirements uh, for on body systems. Um, and now, you know, thinking about the the most basic area of compendia testing, right? So there are compendia tests that go along with elastomers, glass, that containment system, you know, whether it's, you know, the plunger in a pre-filled syringe for a combination product or a stopper that goes on a glass or plastic vial, even the plastic vial, the pl glass vial, the plastic syringe, glass pre-filled syringe, there are compendia requirements on the, each type of these products. Uh, so you also have to be aware of, okay, with the with China, you have the YBBs, um, which are the Chinese compendia requirements. You have the U.S. Um, compendia requirements. And a recent change within components there is USP381 for elastomers, which now they split actually into two different types of compendia. The USP381 for more, more of those chemical testing requirements and USP382, um, which is now more of your functionality, but it has to be looked at as a system, not necessarily on the component itself, but as a system. So manufacturers now have to make sure that they have defined the system and perform that testing on the system versus just the components such as the stopper or you know or the plunger the component itself so that's a change right so working with customers so working with a supplier with a cdmo or a consultant that really understands these changes and can help uh, provide a pathway for the customer to get to how do i address all of these changes that are going on um, from the compendia to the ISO to the regulatory expectations. So we want to make sure that you're working with a knowledgeable base of your partners that can help you navigate through that as you start to develop your systems and your drug product as, as well as put that data together for submitting it to a regulatory agency. I think, Jen, you said that all very well. I think the, really, the, the takeaway is that um, the 
industry needs to move towards taking on more and more systems based testing rather than relying solely on the component manufacturers to do all the testing. And that's also in line with the combination product uh, regulations. And uh, it's more and more important that the industry gear, gear up to do that and take advantage of contract engineering companies and CDMOs that have that capability. I'm curious about what the, so when you're working on your projects, what's that dream team look like? What does your team look like? Who are you? Are you going all the way out to commercial? Are you like, what does that, who are you usually interacting with? What does that look like? As, as a drug sponsor, the interactions, uh, the number of interactions that the drug sponsor has to take on, it's, it's quite a heavy load. Um, you have uh, suppliers, which could be numerous suppliers, even for something simple as a pre-filled syringe. Uh, you have the uh, CDMOs, uh, the health authorities. Um, and then typically the industry has gone out and hired many, many different consultants in the different areas, such as a regulatory consultant, a quality consultant, a human factors consultant, a this consultant, or that consultant. So it becomes a nightmare scenario for a company's procurement team. They're also their quality team, but it's also not an easy way to do business. Uh, the drug companies are taking on, actually their plate is overflowing with contracts rather than being able to focus on the science. So, um, you know, again, uh, where the industry can find, you know, trusted partners that have broad and deep services. Um, that's mm -hmm. really, you know, I think the future of the industry. Yeah, we rely on a lot of consultants um, if we don't have the expertise in house, but definitely seeing the industry doing more of the knowledge sharing or putting out more guidances or having um, more, I guess, communication. And um, just when the clients come in to even see what Graham, how deep our capabilities are, um, we also team up with them and we learn from each other. So there's a lot of um, learning as you go along, which isn't the best way at all times, but it also helps you improve for the next and future projects. So it looks like we're running a little bit up against time on the panel. As you're looking, so we want to look future forward. So what is kind of out there that gets you excited that, you know, is it automation? Is it, you know, better regulation? Is there anything that's that's on the horizon that kind of drives um, any excitement in your industry now or things that you're looking forward to that are kind of coming up? I, I like the dream team. I think that's a good concept. So just seeing more partnerships and um, I've definitely seen it with you know, coming from the component side. So, um, you know, when I worked in that space, definitely partnering with other components to be able to have a proper presentation that was came with a packet of information that the drug company could take to the CDMO. That's just um, more ideal. So I think definitely the dream team concept is I'd like to see that and just sharing more knowledge and definitely working with, you know, our European colleagues and just if it's at a conference or if it's at a trade show or if it's, you know, meeting up, just making that dream team work. I like seeing the industry partner. So suppliers that used to be competitors are starting to join together to, to provide, you know, more integrated solutions and, um, the use of of platforms so um of course they're they're not off off the shelf uh there's always requiring some customization but the use of of platforms um anything from the primary component as a platform uh to auto injectors or wearables that have been you know put through their paces and perhaps commercialized already uh, but also there's platform thinking that can be applied to the back end, to the design history file, 
the packaging instructions for use and human factors. Um, anything that can be done uh, with similar platforms can reduce the time to market and reduce the risk to, um, you know, uh, the regulatory risk as well as uh, make a better product for the patient. So uh, I'll add into that. I, I think what excites me is seeing these new therapies um, that are coming to market, which are almost being curative, um, but they're very complicated therapies. And to trying to figure out how to get that therapy, which could be a curative, could be a cure um, into the patient and how to put it um, where it's a great patient experience. First of all, they're getting this therapy that, um, you know, they may have never had the opportunity to get, but then working with the biologic, the CDMO, putting it into the right type of system and actually making it an experience for the patient where they're getting something that is helping them and we're able to deliver it to them, find a way to actually get it into the patient, which is a ex good experience for the patient is what excites me, you know, and being able to see those types of projects come to fruition uh, when working across that dream team, as, as was mentioned, is really a, exciting. And you, just the feeling that you get when you see that this therapy has been approved for these patients, um, you know, that has been difficult for them to get a certain type of, of therapy. Plus, they're going to be able to get it where it's not an inconvenience and it is a, um, um, a, a, a good experience for them is so exciting. You know, we're in a world of of just new types of um, biologics coming out um, that are actually being, you know, curatives and being a cure in the end, and then being able to deliver that to a patient and us as the dream team being part of that is um, very exciting. That's, that's what I find um, quite outstanding and really what, what gets you excited to, uh, to start your day. So uh, you did mention biologics. So trends in, in the development and delivery of biologics that you're seeing from your perspective? Yeah, certainly across biologics, we're seeing larger and larger volumes wanting to be delivered to the human body where the, you know, there, there is a kind of physiological limit how much you can inject in a single, single in injection. Um, so there is technologies that are uh, working around that one, you know, something like hy hyaluronic acid to, to be able to inject more fluid at a single point. But I think not everything can use hyaluronic acid. Not every product is compatible. So um, as Jed mentioned, there's some technologies out there uh, such as wearable injectors, which really promise to be able to not just inject larger volumes, but also some technologies will be good for higher viscosities. Um, but also they help to manage for the patient, they help to manage things like uh, needle phobia and disposal of, you know, a, a dirty contaminated needle. So there's some safety um, and convenience factors in this new technology that are really uh, game changing for the patient. Yeah, I, uh, you know, also one thing um, that we have seen in addition to to what Mike said, a hundred percent on point um, in terms of looking different at different types of of delivery systems for those larger volumes of drug being being needed to be delivered over time, larger viscosities, etc., is also storage, um, cold chain. Um, storage of these types of therapies, right? That require refrigerated conditions uh, from, from that end. So it's making sure that your device and your material that you're using, depending on how you're storing it, how you're shipping it, if you're shipping it on dry ice, you've got to make sure the materials that you're shipping on dry ice with um, can withstand the, you know, negative 80 degrees C to negative 120 degrees C and making sure that it's the package remains integral 
under those temperatures at those at that time. So shipping studies, shipping containments um, need to be done when you are looking at these cold chain ther these therapies that will be cold chain. Um, even the device, um, some people, you know, think you're thinking of the plastics that you might be using in the device. Can that device withstand the colder temperatures where you don't have any issues with cracking of that, of that material, uh, under cold temperatures, depending on how you're storing it, how you're shipping it. Um, and, you know, you think of the pressures when these things have to go up into airplanes, being able to withstand the pressures and the coldness uh, that increases, um, you know, as you go up um, in, in airplanes as you're shipping these products. So it's we see a lot of uh, challenges popping up and concerns that we need to address around storage of these uh, different types of, of products, especially when they're when you're looking at refrigerated, frozen, and and deep frozen conditions. Um, Michael, what you did say too, we are seeing smaller volumes as well. Meaning we have clients that will come in and um, like the orphan drugs. There's probably not in the you know hundreds of millions, but like a smaller. So trying to be more adaptable to that as well, or um, different formats like single or multi-dose, if we're just gonna be specific to vials right now, we're seeing a trend in that as well. So they'll come to us with a smaller vial size and a larger vial size, and then they'll want them in a certain amount. So just being capable of not always producing those large scales, but also you know, the smaller scales for the different needs out in the, the patients and what they need to have. Yeah, H having the capability to fill small quantities of product for engineering studies, for clinical studies, for human factors studies use, uh, what have you, that's really uh, a capability that we we uh, we need more of in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's becoming more and more uh, of a, a hard uh, hard capability to find. So as a reminder to those out there, we do have a couple of minutes to take more questions. So if you want to go ahead and submit any questions you have into the questions and answers tab, we'll do our best to get to all of those. Um, and if we can't, we'll actually connect with you after the event if you've given us those permissions. So go ahead and put those in there. All right, we have a few. Um, I'm going to start with this one that's for Rebecca that uh, at least I want to start with Rebecca on this one because it's about um, contract manufacturing. And then if uh, anyone else has wants to join in, please do. But what equipment best supports contract manufacturers? So the type of equipment that you might have, um, especially when you're taking on multiple product scenarios. So I would say flexible and modular equipment. Most recently, Graham has invested in a um, variosis from Bausch & Strobel. This allows great flexibility with a wide range of products and configurations. So it's able to accommodate vials ready to use or bulk, syringes, cartridges, and even smaller batch sizes, which can be scaled up. Did you want to add anything, Michael, to that? Oh, that's excellent. I think in addition to the filling equipment, um, the ability to test complicated combination products, uh, it requires some special equipment um, such as an Instron or a SWIC, um, but also uh, visual inspection equipment. So um, the company's uh, equipment is, is pretty critical to success. What impact does one platform technology have on a product being studied for multiple indications? Uh, so multiple indications uh, may require different types of formats, depending on who's actually going to administer the drug, whether it's administered by a HCP or at home by a, a injecting mm -hmm. the, the patient, injecting themselves or a caregiver. Um, and um, so these different formats should be considered different products, even though they may have the same, same drug inside of them. 
Um, and of course, as we talked about earlier, uh, these different formats do require completely different project plans. Um, and um, uh, the, the testing, the uh, regulatory pathways, um, they're completely different. Um, and then back to the CMO's capability, um, you should ensure that your CMO has the ability to to run both formats, of course, and then to support them from a, a, a human, uh, um, you know, HR perspective. They have enough people and qualified people to do both at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that one. Looking at the different types of, of platforms that are out there, they do have to be looked at differently. Um, however, within a platform, though, if you're qualifying different types of um, materials or components within a, a platform, you want to make sure that you're understanding uh, what the differences what the differences are and the compatibilities across the different materials within within that platform. As, as Mike indicated, when you move to a totally different platform, um, let's say you're you're starting with a, a vial stopper and seal, you're moving to a pre-filled syringe, you want to minimize um, any incompatibility issues. So if that drug product saw that material in one platform, um, hopefully you can have that similar contact material available from the containment system piece in, in the other platform as you move through that, that life cycle management of that, that product. So it's important to look at that, that co compatibility from, from that end. Uh, but really, when you move from one platform to the other, as Mike indicated, you're really looking at two different approaches and, and um, platform plans that you need to put in place. Looks like we have a lot of questions in here concerning supply chain. I guess that's a, definitely something that's um, impacting uh, folks. So I'm going to try to combine some questions. And then depending on how this goes, this may be our last question, just depending on how time, time goes. So if you do have a question that I haven't addressed, know that if you've given us permissions those will get to the speakers and they can follow up after the event so i see some in here that are specifically for particular people and you will be followed up with all right so two parts one everyone's curious about when supply chains are going to get back to normal <laughs> i don't know if you have any input on that um, especially when it comes to things like injectable components and wait times. I don't know if, if anyone's seeing any improvement or thinking maybe we'll have some supply chain issues for a while and how long that might be to get back to pre-COVID. So if we all had a crystal ball, I think it would be, um, you know, we'd like to have it move, um, you know, uh, be back to normal, uh, you know, quicker than than uh, than we'd like than we're seeing. Um, but when you look at um, the the time now, you know there are some there are still supply chain issues out there. There are still um, issues getting different types of materials with manufacturers, um, as, as well as you know supply. Looking at all the manufacturers of the end products, then getting it out to the manufacturers of the drug products. So we're we're still seeing um, delays in the supply chain, one to two years. Um, you know, uh, for injectable component wait times, you know, it's 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 really dependent. There's a lot of components out there, <laughs> so it really depends in in terms of what a, exactly you're you're looking at the the type of component, um, the processing of that component exactly from from that end. Um, you know, we are seeing you know on our end. Uh, demand for components, which of course our, our backlog has increased, especially you know as we kind of um, head here into into the end of the year, into into the new year. Um, but it really depends on on the components and you know the quantity of components and and things like that. But if there is um, you know I see that 
question. If there is specific questions on component wait times of what you're looking for, feel free to, to contact me if it's a West component and we can talk through um, some some of the wait times that that maybe you you are seeing if you are seeing any. Michael, did you have thoughts on this one? Wait times? Sure, you... many thoughts. Um, I, I think, you know, the component <laughs> selection Component selection and interaction with the drug, um, of course, it's critical, but I think the earlier you can um, characterize your drug and understand what family of components can be used, and maybe not just hone in on one specific component, but as a risk mitigation, I mean, t talk to your suppliers and your CDMOs early, but perhaps you want to screen your uh, drug um, physiochemical attributes uh, against several different components. Hmm. So on supply chain still, um, how are supply chains and external suppliers evolving and preparing for uh, multiple product scenarios? So have you seen any evolution in your partner. I, I guess from a, a client perspective, what what we're seeing is uh, where uh, CDMOs are are becoming more broad. Um, they're uh, they're building building more capability, uh, more equipment, as Rebecca mentioned. You know, flexible equipment. Um, but also offering more services, whether it's internally provided or they have strategic partnerships with uh, contract uh, development organizations outside themselves. Um, so I think in general, uh, we're all looking to uh, bring more services to the table and help accelerate uh, time to market. Jennifer, did you have any thoughts on supply chain? I know that you were on a delay. So, <laughs> so uh, on uh, <laughs> the, avail the availability of uh, components from a supply chain perspective now post COVID or um, how external suppliers are evolving to prepare for this particular uh, scenario of um, having multiple scenarios for a product. Yeah, I, I think, you know, in terms of supply chain from from a COVID perspective, as I, I mentioned, you know, we are, we're still recovering in terms of picking up and um, making sure we're meeting the needs of, of customers to get those critical uh, components out that are currently on the market, um, you know, to because in the end they have to get to the patients. Um, but there is a, a recovery period, you know, coming out of COVID and making sure that we're addressing all the new new types of uh, therapies that are out there as well. Um, making sure from that perspective that they are able to get. Um, different types of components for clinical studies and, and things like that to get moving on those new types of, of drug products. Um, but also, as Mike indicated, you know, be before previously that um, when you are looking at different component systems, you probably want to make sure you're looking at a few different types, right? To make sure that you, you have your primary, then maybe you have your secondary and associated with that. So that way you're risk mitigating any of your supply. And especially now post COVID, right? We've learned so much um, from consumer products to, <laughs> to everything else. I know, you know, I've um, had a few things that I've had to live without uh, for a period of time during COVID because we just couldn't get them or long lead times of, of certain things. So I think um, the industry as, as well as us personally have, have learned from that and, and you know, in order to risk mitigate in the future as we're coming out of this, even though there are still supply chain issues, making sure you are qualifying and risk mitigating um, your, your supply um, and your suppliers that you're utilizing. Yes, I think second sourcing is really important in this, especially when we see clients come forward when they're just locked into one component. We have a very hard time meeting their timelines 
So if they have an alternate, you know, qualification characterization of another supplier, we're able to meet timelines better. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I think we are hitting up on some time uh, restraint. So I, I think that's uh, the end of our Q&A. Um, but thank you all very much for um, adding your thought leadership to this discussion. And uh, we really appreciate you being here today. So thank you. Thank you. It was a thank pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you to the audience for attending this Fierce Pharma webinar and supporting so many great uh, and submitting so many great, great questions. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers again for participating. Thank you. And Grand River Aseptic Manufacturing for making today's webinar possible. This webinar has been recorded. It'll be available to access within 24 hours using the same audience link that you used to get in here. Um, and thank you again for joining. We look forward to seeing you at future events.